Hi, guys. Mrs. Sense by Jhumpa Lahiri. Read by me, Jordan Barclay, because I want to. Alright, let's dive in. Elliot had been going to Mrs. Sen's for nearly a month, ever since school started in September. The year before, he was looked after by a university student named Abby, a slim, freckled girl who read books without pictures on their covers, and refused to prepare any food for Elliot containing meat. Before that, an older woman, Mrs. Linden, greeted him when he came home each afternoon, sipping coffee from a thermos and working on crossword puzzles while Elliot played on his own. Abby received her degree and moved off to another university. While Miss Linden was, in the end, fired when Elliot's mother discovered that Mrs. Linden's thermos contained more whiskey than coffee, Mrs. Sen came to them in tidy ballpoint script, posted on an index card outside the supermarket. Professor's wife, responsible and kind, I will care for your child in my home. On the telephone, Elliot's mother told Mrs. Sen that the previous babysitters had come to their house. Elliot is 11. He can feed and entertain himself. I just want an adult in the house, in case of an emergency. But Mrs. Sen did not know how to drive. As you see, our home is quite clean, quite safe for a child. Mrs. Sen had said at their first meeting, it was a university apartment located on the fringes of the campus. The lobby was tiled in unattractive squares of tan, with a row of mailboxes marked with masking tape or white labels. Inside, intersecting shadows left by a vacuum cleaner were frozen on the surface of a plush pear-colored carpet. Mismatched remnants of other carpets were positioned in front of the sofa and chairs, like individual welcome mats anticipating where a person's feet would contact the floor. White, drum-shaped lampshades flanking the sofa were still wrapped in the manufacturer's plastic. The TV and the telephone were covered by pieces of yellow fabric with scalloped edges. There was tea in a tall gray pot, along with mugs, and butter biscuits on a tray. Mr. Sen, a short, stocky man with slightly protuberant eyes, and glasses with black rectangular frames, had been there too. He crossed his legs with some comfort, and held his mug with both hands very close to his mouth, even when he wasn't drinking. Neither Mr. nor Mrs. Sen wore shoes. Elliot noticed several pairs lined on the shelves of a small bookcase by the front door. They wore flip-flops. Mr. Sen teaches mathematics at the university. Mrs. Sen had said by way of introduction, as if they were only distantly acquainted. She was about 30. She had a small gap between her teeth and faded pockmarks on her chin. Her eyes were beautiful, with thick, flaring brows and liquid flourishes that extended beyond the natural width of the lids. She wore a shimmering white sari patterned with orange paisleys, more suitable for an evening affair than for that quiet, faintly drizzling August afternoon. Her lips were coated in a complimentary coral gloss, and a bit of the color had strayed beyond the borders. Yet it was his mother, Elliot had thought, in her cuffed, beige shorts and her rope-soled shoes, who looked odd. Her cropped hair, a shade similar to her shorts, seemed too lank and sensible. And in that room, where all things were so carefully covered, her shaved knees and thighs too exposed. She refused a biscuit each time. Mrs. Sen extended the plate in her direction and asked a long series of questions, the answers to which she recorded on steno pads. Would there be another children in the apartment? Had Mrs. Sen cared for children before? How long had she lived in this country? Most of all, she was concerned that Mrs. Sen did not know how to drive. Elliot's mother worked in an office 50 miles north, and his father, the last she had heard, lived 2,000 miles west. I have been giving her lessons, actually, Mr. Sen said, setting his mug on the coffee table. It was the first time he had spoken. By my estimate, 
Mrs. Sen should have her driver's license by December. Is that so? Elliot's mother noted the information on her pad. Yes, I am learning, Mrs. Sen said. But I am a slow student. At home, you know, we have a driver. You mean a chauffeur? Mrs. Sen glanced at Mr. Sen, who nodded. Elliot's mother nodded too, looking around the room. And that's all in India? Yes, Mrs. Sen replied. The mention of the word seemed to release something in her. She neatened the border of a sari where it rose diagonally across her chest. She, too, looked around the room, as if she noticed in the lampshades, in the teapot, in the shadows frozen on the carpet, something the rest of them could not. Everything is there. Elliot didn't mind going to Mrs. Sen's after school. By September, the tiny beach house where he and his mother lived year-round was already cold. Elliot and his mother had to bring a portable heater along whenever they moved from one room to another, and to seal the windows with plastic sheets and a hairdryer. The beach was barren and dull to play on alone. The only neighbors who stayed on past Labor Day, a young married couple, had no children, and Elliot no longer found it interesting to gather broken mussel shells in his bucket, or to strip the seaweed, strewn like strips of emerald lasagna on the sand. Mrs. Sen's apartment was warm, sometimes too warm. The radiators continuously hissed like a pressure cooker. Elliot learned to remove his sneakers first thing in Mrs. Sen's doorway, and to place them on the bookcase next to a row of Mrs. Sen's slippers, each a different color, with soles as flat as cardboard and a ring of leather to hold her big toe. He especially enjoyed watching Mrs. Sen as she chopped things seated on newspapers on the living room floor. Instead of a knife, she used a blade that curved like the prow of a Viking ship, sailing to battle in distant seas. The blade was hinged at one end to a narrow wooden base. The steel, more black than silver, lacked a uniform polish and had a serrated crest. She told Elliot for grating. Each afternoon, Mrs. Sen lifted the blade and locked it into place, so that it met at the base at an angle. Facing the sharp edge without ever touching it, she took whole vegetables between her hands and hacked them apart. Cauliflower, cabbage, butternut squash. She split things in half, then quarters, speedily producing florets, cubes, slices, and shreds. She could peel a potato in seconds. At times she sat cross-legged, at times with legs splayed, surrounded by an array of colanders and shallow bowls of water in which she immersed her chopped ingredients. While she worked, she kept an eye on the television and an eye on Elliot, but she never seemed to keep an eye on the blade. Nevertheless, she refused to let Elliot walk around when she was chopping. Just sit, please. It will take two more minutes, she said pointing to the sofa, which was draped at all times with a green and black bed cover printed with rows of elephants bearing palanquins on their back. The daily procedure took about an hour. In order to occupy Elliot, she supplied him with the comic section of the newspaper, and crackers spread with peanut butter, and sometimes a popsicle, or carrot sticks sculpted with her blade. She would have roped off the area if she could. Once, though, she broke her own rule. In need of additional supplies, and reluctant to rise from the catastrophic mess that had barricaded her, she asked Elliot to fetch something from the kitchen. If you don't mind, there is a plastic ball, large enough to hold this spinach, in the cabinet next to the fridge. Careful, oh dear, be careful! She cautioned as he approached. Just, just leave it! Thank you! On the coffee table, I can reach! She had brought the blade from India, where apparently there was at least one in every household. Whenever there is a wedding in the family, she told Elliot one day, or a large celebration of any kind, 
My mother sends out word in the evening for all the neighborhood women to bring blades just like this one, and then they sit in an enormous circle on the roof of our building, laughing and gossiping and slicing 50 kilos of vegetables through the night. Her profile hovered protectively over her work. A confetti of cucumber, eggplant, and onion skins heaped around her. It is impossible to fall asleep those nights, listening to their chatter. She paused to look at a pine tree framed by the living room window. Here, in this place where Mr. Sen has brought me, I cannot sometimes sleep in so much silence. Another day she sat prying the pimpled yellow fat off chicken parts, then dividing them between thigh and leg. As the bones cracked apart over the blade, her golden bangles jolted, her arms glowed, and she exhaled audibly through her nose. At one point she paused, gripping the chicken with both hands, and stared out the window. Fat and sinew clung to her fingers. Elliot, if I began to scream right now at the top of my lungs, would someone come? Mrs. Sen, what's wrong? Nothing. I am only asking if someone would come. Elliot shrugged. Maybe. At home, that is all you have to do. Not everybody has a telephone. But just raise your voice a bit, or express grief or joy of any kind, and one whole neighborhood and half another has come to share the news, to help with arrangements. By then, Elliot understood that when Mrs. Sen said home, she meant India, not the apartment where she sat chopping vegetables. She thought of his own home, just five miles away, and the young married couple who waved from time to time as they jogged at sunset along the shore. On Labor Day, they'd had a party. People were piled on the deck, eating, drinking, the sound of their laughter rising above the weary sigh of waves. Elliot and his mother weren't invited. It was one of the rare days his mother had off, but they didn't go anywhere. She did the laundry and balanced the checkbook and, with Elliot's help, vacuumed the inside of the car. Elliot had suggested that they go through the car wash a few miles down the road, as they did every now and then, so that they could sit inside, safe and dry. As soap and water and a circle of giant canvas ribbons slapped the windshield, but his mother said she was too tired, and sprayed the car with a hose. When, by evening, the crowd on the neighbors' deck began dancing. She looked up their number in the phone book and asked them to keep it down. They might call you, Elliot said eventually to Mrs. Sen, but they might complain that you were making too much noise. From where Elliot sat on the sofa, he could detect the curious scent of mothballs and cumin, and he could see the perfectly centered part in her braided hair, which was shaded with crushed vermilion and therefore appeared to be blushing. At first, Elliot had wondered if she had cut her scalp, or if something had bitten her there, but then one day he saw her standing before the bathroom mirror, solemnly applying, with the head of a thumbtack, a fresh stroke of scarlet powder which she stored in a small jam jar. A few grains of the powder fell onto the bridge of her nose as she used the thumbtack to stamp a dot above her eyebrows. I must wear the powder every day, she explained when Elliot asked her what it was for. For the rest of the days that I am married. Like a wedding ring, you mean? Exactly, Elliot. Exactly like a wedding ring. Only with no fear of losing it in the dishwasher. By the time Elliot's mother arrived at twenty past six, Mrs. Sen always made sure all evidence of her chopping was disposed of. The blade was scrubbed, rinsed, dried, folded, and stowed away in a cupboard with the aid of a stepladder. With Elliot's help, the newspapers were crushed with all the peels and seeds and skins inside them. Brimming bowls and colanders lined the countertop. Spices and pastes were measured and blended and eventually a collection of broths simmered over periwinkle flames on the stove. It was never a special occasion, nor was she ever expecting company. It was merely dinner for herself and Mr. Sen, 
as indicated by the two plates and two glasses she set. Without napkins or silverware, on the square forming a table at one end of the living room. As he pressed the newspapers deeper into the garbage pail, Elliot felt that he and Mrs. Sen were disobeying some unspoken rule. Perhaps it was because of the urgency with which Mrs. Sen accomplished everything, pinching salt and sugar between her fingernails, running water through lentils, sponging all imaginable surfaces, shutting cupboard doors with a series of successive clicks. It gave him a little shock to see his mother all of a sudden, in the transparent stockings and shoulder-padded suits she wore to her job, peering into the corners of Mrs. Sen's apartment. She tended to hover on the far side of the doorframe, calling to Elliot to put on his sneakers and gather his things. But Mrs. Sen would not allow it. Each evening she insisted that his mother sit on the sofa, where she was served something to eat. A glass of bright pink yogurt with rose syrup, breaded mincemeat with raisins, a bowl of semolina halva. Really, Mrs. Sen, I take a late lunch. You shouldn't go to much trouble. It is no trouble. Just like Elliot, no trouble at all. His mother nibbled Mrs. Sen's concoctions with eyes cast upward in search of an opinion. She kept her knees pressed together. The high heels she never removed pressed into the pear cloth carpet. It's delicious, she would conclude, setting down the plate after a bite or two. Elliot knew she didn't like the taste. She'd told him so once in the car. He also knew she didn't eat lunch at work, because the first thing she did when they were back at the beach house was pour herself a glass of wine and eat bread and cheese sometimes so much of it that she wasn't hungry for the pizza they normally ordered for dinner. She sat at the table as she ate, drinking more wine and asking how his day was. But eventually she went to the deck to smoke a cigarette, leaving Elliot to wrap up the leftovers. Each afternoon, Mrs. Sen stood in a grove of pine trees by the main road, where the school bus dropped off Elliot along with two or three other children who lived nearby. Elliot always sensed that Mrs. Sen had been waiting for some time, as if eager to greet a person she hadn't seen in years. The hair at her temples blew about in the breeze, the column of vermilion fresh in her part. She wore navy blue sunglasses a little too big on her face. Her sari, a different pattern each day, fluttered below the hem of a checkered, all-weather coat. Acorns and caterpillars dotted the asphalt loop that framed the complex of about a dozen brick buildings, all identical, embedded in a communal expense of log chips. As they walked past from the bus stop, she produced a sandwich bag from her pocket and offered Elliot the peeled wedges of an orange, or lightly salted peanuts, which she had already shelled. They proceeded directly to the car and for 20 minutes, Mrs. Sen practiced driving. It was a toffee-colored sedan with vinyl seats. There was an AM radio with chrome buttons, and on the ledge over the back seat, a box of Kleenex and an ice scraper. Mrs. Sen told Elliot she didn't feel right leaving him alone in the apartment, but Elliot knew she wanted him sitting beside her because she was afraid. She dreaded the roar of the ignition and placed her hands over her ears to block out the sound as she pressed her slippered feet to the gas, revving the engine. Mr. Sen says that once I receive my license, everything will improve. What do you think, Elliot? Will things improve? You could go places, Elliot suggested. You could go anywhere. Could I drive all the way to Calcutta? How long would that take, Elliot? 10,000 miles. At 50 miles per hour? Elliot could not do the math in his head. He watched Mrs. Sen adjust the driver's seat, the rearview mirror, the sunglasses on top of her head. She tuned the radio to a station that played symphonies. Is it Beethoven? She asked once, pronouncing the first part of the composer's name not Bay, but B, like the insect. She rolled down the window on her side and asked Elliot to do the same. Eventually, she pressed her foot to the brake pedal, manipulated the automatic gear shift as if it were an enormous leaky pen, 
and backed inch by inch out of the parking space. She cycled the apartment complex once, then once again. How am I doing, Elliot? Am I going to pass? She was continuously distracted. She stopped the car without warning to listen to something on the radio, or to stare at something, anything, in the road. If she passed a person, she waved. If she saw a bird 20 feet in front of her, she beeped the horn with her index finger and waited for it to fly away. In India, she said, the driver sat on the right side, not the left. Slowly they crept past the swing set, the laundry building, the dark green trash bins, the rows of parked cars. Each time they approached the grove of pine trees where the asphalt loop met the main road, she leaned forward, pinning all her weight against the brake as cars hurtled past. It was a narrow road painted with a solid yellow stripe, with one lane of traffic in either direction. Impossible, Elliot. How can I go there? You need to wait until no one's coming. Why will not anybody slow down? No one's coming now. But what about the car from the right, do you see? And look, a truck is behind it. Anyway, I am not allowed on the main road without Mr. Sen. You have to turn and speed up fast, Elliot said. That was the way his mother did it, as if without talking. It seemed so simple when he sat beside his mother gliding in the evenings back to the beach house. Then the road was just a road, the other cars merely part of the scenery. But when he sat with Mrs. Sen, under an autumn sun that glowed without warmth through the trees, he saw how that same stream of cars made her knuckles pale, her wrists tremble, and her English falter. Everyone, this people, too much in their world. Two things. Elliot learned, made Mrs. Sen happy. One was the arrival of a letter from my family. It was her custom to check the mailbox after driving practice. She would unlock the box, but she would ask Elliot to reach inside, telling him what to look for. And then she would shut her eyes and shield them with her hands while she shuffled through the bills and magazines that came in Mr. Sen's name. At first, Elliot found Mrs. Sen's anxiety incomprehensible. His mother had a P.O. box in town, and she collected mail so infrequently that once the electricity was cut off for three days. Weeks passed at Mrs. Sen's before he found a blue aerogram, grainy to the touch, crammed with stamps showing a bald man at a spinning wheel, and blackened by postmarks. Is this it, Mrs. Sen? For the first time, she embraced him, clasping his face to her sorry surrounding him with her odor of mothballs and cumin. She seized the letters from his hand. As soon as they were inside the apartment, she kicked off her slippers this way and that, drew a wire pin from her hair, and slit the top and sides of the aerogram in three strokes. Her eyes darted back and forth as she read. As soon as she was finished, she cast aside the embroidery that covered the phone, dialed, and asked, Yes? Is Mr. Sen there? Please. It is Mrs. Sen, and it is very important. Subsequently, she spoke in her own language, rapid and riotous to Elliot's ears. It was clear that she was reading the contents of the letter, word by word. As she read, her voice was louder and seemed to shift in key. Though she stood plainly before him, Elliot had the sensation that Mrs. Sen was no longer present in the room with the pear-colored carpet. After the apartment was suddenly too small to contain her, they crossed the main road and walked a short distance to the university quadrangle, where bells in a stone tower chimed on the hour. They wandered through the student union and dragged a tray together along the cafeteria ledge and ate french fries heaped in a cardboard boat among students chatting at circular tables. Elliot drank soda from a paper cup. Mrs. Sen steeped a tea bag with sugar and cream. After eating, they explored the art building, looking at sculptures and silk screens in cool corridors thick with the fragrance of wet paint and clay. They walked past the mathematics building, where Mr. Sen taught his classes. They ended up in the noisy, chlorine-scented wing of the athletic building, where, through a white window on the fourth floor, 
They watched swimmers crossing from end to end in glaring turquoise pools. Mrs. Sen took the aerogram from India out of her purse and studied the front and back. She unfolded it and reread to herself, sighing every now and then. When she had finished, she gazed for some time at the swimmers. My sister has had a baby go. By the time I see her, depending if Mr. Sen gets his tenure, she will be three years old. Her aunt will be a stranger. If we sit side by side on a train, she will not know my face. She put away the letter, then placed a hand on Elliot's head. Do you miss your mother, Elliot, these afternoons with me? The thought had never occurred to him. You must miss her. When I think of you, only a boy, separated from your mother for so much of the day, I am ashamed. I see her at night. When I was your age, I was without knowing that one day I would be so far. You were wiser than that, Elliot. You already taste the way things must be. The other thing that made Mrs. Sen happy was fish from the seaside. It was always a whole fish she desired, not shellfish, or the fillets Elliot's mother had broiled one night a few months ago when she'd invited a man from her office to dinner. A man who'd spend the night in his mother's bedroom, but whom Elliot never saw again. One evening when Elliot's mother came to pick him up, Mrs. Sen served her a tuna croquet, explaining that it was really supposed to be made with a fish called Bekti. It is very frustrating, Mrs. Sen apologized, with an emphasis on the second syllable of the word. To live so close to the ocean and not to have so much fish. In the summer, she said, she liked to go to a market by the beach. She added that while the fish there tasted nothing like the fish in India, at least it was fresh. Now that it was getting colder, the boats were no longer going out regularly, and sometimes there was no whole fish available for weeks at a time. Try the supermarket, his mother suggested. Mrs. Sen shook her head. In the supermarket, I can feed a cat 32 dinners from one of 32 tins, but I can never find a single fish I like. Never a single. Mrs. Sen said she had grown up eating fish twice a day. She added that in Calcutta, people ate fish first thing in the morning, last thing before bed, as a snack after school if they were lucky. They ate the tail, the eggs, even the head. It was available in any market, at any hour, from dawn until midnight. All you have to do is leave the house and walk a bit, and there you are. Every few days, Mrs. Sen would open up the yellow pages, dial a number that she had ticked in the margin, and ask if there was any whole fish available. If so, she would ask the market to hold it. Under Sen, yes, S as in Sam, N as in New York. Mr. Sen will be there to pick it up. Then she would call Mr. Sen at the university. A few moments later, Mr. Sen would arrive, patting Elliot on the head but not kissing Mrs. Sen. He read his mail at the Formica table and drank a cup of tea before heading out. Half an hour later, he would return, carrying a paper bag with a smiling lobster drawn on the front of it, and hand it to Mrs. Sen, and head back to the university to teach his evening class. One day, when he handed Mrs. Sen the paper bag, he said, no more fish for a while. Cook the kitchen in the freezer. I need to start holding office hours. For the next few days, instead of calling the fish market, Mrs. Sen thawed chicken legs in the kitchen sink and chopped them with her blade. One day she made a stew with green beans and tinned sardines. But the following week, the man who ran the fish market called Mrs. Sen. He assumed she wanted the fish and said he would hold it until the end of the day under her name. She was flattered. Isn't that nice of him, Elliot? The man said he'd look up my name in the telephone book. He said there was only one sen. Do you know how many sens are in the Calcutta telephone book? She told Elliot to put on his shoes and his jacket, and then she called Mr. Sen at the university. Elliot tied his sneakers by the bookcase and waited for her to join him, to choose from her row of slippers. After a few minutes, he called out her name. When Mrs. Sen did not reply... He untied his sneakers and returned to the living room, where he found her on the sofa, weeping. Her face was in her hands, and tears dripped through her fingers. 
Through them, she murmured something about a meeting Mr. Sen was required to attend. Slowly, she stood up and rearranged the cloth over the telephone. Elliot followed her, walking for the first time in a sneakers across the pear-colored carpet. She stared at him. Her lower eyelids were swollen into thin pink crests. Tell me, Elliot, is it too much to ask? Before he could answer, she took him by the hand and led him to the bedroom, whose door was normally kept shut. Apart from the bed, which lacked a headboard, the only other things in the room were a side table with a telephone on it, an ironing board, and a bureau. She flung open the drawers of the bureau and the door of the closet, filled with the saris of every imaginable texture and shade, brocaded with gold and silver threads. Some were transparent, tissue thin, others as thick as drapes, with tassels knotted along the edges. In the closet, they were on hangers. In the drawers, they were folded flat, or wound tightly like thick scrolls. She sifted through the drawers, letting sorry spill over the edges. When have I ever worn this one? And this? And this? She tossed the saris one by one from the drawer, then pried several from her hangers. They landed like a pile of tangled sheets on the bed. The room was filled with an intense smell of mothballs. Send pictures, they write. Send pictures of your new life. What pictures can I send? She sat, exhausted, on the edge of the bed, where there was now barely room for her. They think I live the life of a queen, Elliot. She looked around the blank walls of the room. They think I press buttons and the house is clean. They think I live in a palace. The phone rang. Mrs. Sen let it ring several times before picking up the extension by the bed. During the conversation, she seemed only to be replying to things and wiping her face with the ends of one of the saris. When she got off the phone, she stuffed the saris without folding them back into the drawers. And then she and Elliot put on their shoes and went to the car, where they waited for Mrs. Sen to meet them. Why don't you drive today? Mr. Sen asked when he appeared, rapping on the hood of the car with his knuckles. They always spoke to each other in English when Elliot was present. Not today. Another day. How do you expect to pass the test if you refuse to drive on a road with other cars? Elliot is here today. He is here every day. It's for your own good. Elliot, tell Mrs. Sen it's for her own good. She refused. They drove in silence along the same roads that Elliot and his mother took back to the beach house each evening. But in the back seat of Mr. and Mrs. Sen's car, the ride seemed unfamiliar and took longer than usual. The gulls whose tedious cries woke him each morning now thrilled him as they dipped and flapped across the sky. They passed one beach after another, and the shacks, now locked up, that sold frozen lemonade and quahogs in the summer. Only one of the shacks was open, it was the fish market. Mrs. Sen unlocked her door and turned toward Mr. Sen, who had not yet unfastened his seatbelt. Are you coming? Mr. Sen handed her some bills from his wallet. I have a meeting in a few minutes, he said, staring at the dashboard as he spoke. Please don't waste my time. Elliot accompanied her to the dank little shop, whose walls were festooned with nets and starfish and boys. A group of tourists with cameras around their necks huddled by the camera, some sampling stuffed clams, others pointing to a large chart illustrating 50 different varieties of North Atlantic fish. Mrs. Sen took a ticket from the machine at the counter and waited in line. Elliot stood by the lobsters, which stood one on top of another in their murky tank, their claws bound by yellow rubber bands. He watched as Mr. Sen laughed and chatted. When it was her turn in line, with a man with a bright red face and yellow teeth, dressed in a black rubber apron, in either hand he held a mackerel by the tail. You are sure what you sell me is very fresh? Any fresher, and they'd answer the question themselves. The dial shivered toward its verdict on the scale. You want this cleaned, Mrs. Sen? She nodded. Leave the heads on, please. 
You got cats at home? No cats, only a husband. Later in the apartment, she pulled the blade out of the cupboard, spread newspaper across the carpet, and inspected her treasures. One by one she drew them from the paper wrapping, wrinkled and tinged with blood. She stroked the tails, prodded the bellies, pried apart the gutted flesh. With a pair of scissors, she clipped the fins. She tucked a finger under the gills, a red so bright they made her vermilion seem pale. She grasped the body, lined with inky streaks, at either end, and noticed it at intervals against the blade. Why do you do that? Elliot asked. To see how many pieces. If I cut properly from this fish, I will get three meals. She sawed off the head and set it on a pie plate. In November came a series of days when Mrs. Sen refused to practice driving. The blade never emerged from the cupboard. Newspapers were not spread on the floor. She did not call the fish store, nor did she thaw chicken. In silence, she prepared crackers with peanut butter for Elliot, then sat reading old aerograms from a shoebox. When it was time for Elliot to leave, she gathered together his things without inviting his mother to sit on the sofa and eat something first. When, eventually, his mother asked him in the car if he noticed a change in Mrs. Sen's behavior. He said he hadn't. He didn't tell her that Mrs. Sen paced the apartment, staring at plastic-covered lampshades as if noticing them for the first time. He didn't tell her she switched on the television but never watched it, or that she made herself tea but let it grow cold on the coffee table. One day she played a tape of something she called a raga. It sounded a little bit like someone plucking very slowly and then very quickly on a violin, and Mrs. Sen said it was supposed to be heard only in the late afternoon. As the sun was setting, as the music played, for nearly an hour, she sat on the sofa with her eyes closed. Afterwards, she said, It is more sad even than your Beethoven, isn't it? Another day, she played a cassette of people talking in her language. A farewell present, she told Elliot, that her family had made for her. As a succession of voices laughed and said their bit, Mrs. Sen identified each speaker. My third uncle, my cousin, my father, my grandfather. One speaker sang a song. Another recited a poem. The final voice on the tape belonged to Mrs. Sen's mother. It was quieter and sounded more serious than the others. There was a pause between each sentence, and during this pause, Mrs. Sen translated for Elliot. The price of goat rose two rupees. The mangoes at the market are not very sweet. College Street is flooded. She turned off the tape. These are things that happened the day I left India. The next day, she played the same cassette all over again. This time, with her grandfather was speaking, she stopped the tape. This time, when her grandfather was speaking, she stopped the tape. She told Elliot she'd received a letter over the weekend. Her grandfather was dead. A week later, Mrs. Sen began cooking again. One day she sat slicing cabbage on the living room floor. Mr. Sen called. He wanted to take Elliot and Mrs. Sen to the seaside. For the occasion, Mrs. Sen put on a red sari and red lipstick. She freshened the vermilion in her part and rebraided her hair. She knotted a scarf under her chin, arranged her sunglasses on top of her head, and put a pocket camera in her purse. As Mr. Sen backed out of the parking lot, he put his arm across the top of the front seat, so that it looked as if he had his arm around Mrs. Sen. It's getting too cold for that top coat, he said to her at one point. We should get you something warmer. At the shop, they brought mackerel, and butterfish, and sea bass. This time Mr. Sen came into the shop with them. It was Mr. Sen who asked whether the fish was fresh, and to cut it this way or that way. They brought so much fish that Elliot had to hold one of the bags. After they put the bags in the trunk, Mr. Sen announced that he was hungry, and Mrs. Sen agreed. So they crossed the street to a restaurant where the takeout window was still open. They sat at a picnic table and ate two baskets of clam cakes. Mrs. Sen put a good deal of Tabasco sauce and black pepper on hers. Like pakoras, no? 
Her face was flushed. Her lipstick faded. And she laughed at everything Mr. Sen said. Behind the restaurant was a small beach. And when they were done eating, they walked for a while along the shore, into a wind so strong that they had to walk backward. Mrs. Sen pointed to the water, and said that at a certain moment, each wave resembled a sari drying on the clothesline. Impossible! She shouted eventually, laughing as she turned back, her eyes teary. I cannot move! Instead, she took a picture of Elliot and Mr. Sen standing on the sand. Now one of us, she said, pressing Elliot against her checkered coat and giving the camera to Mr. Sen. Finally, the camera was given to Elliot. Hold it steady, said Mr. Sen. Elliot looked through the tiny window in the camera and waited for Mr. and Mrs. Sen to move closer together, but they didn't. They didn't hold hands or put their arms around each other's waist. Both smiled with their mouth closed, squinting into the wind. Mrs. Sen's red sari leaping like flames under her coat. In the car, warm at last and exhausted from the wind and the clam cakes, they admired the dunes, the ships they could see in the distance, the view of the lighthouse, the peach and purple sky. After a while, Mr. Sen slowed down and stopped by the side of the road. What's wrong? Mrs. Sen asked. You were going to drive home today. Not today. Yes, today. Mr. Sen stepped out of the car and opened the door on Mrs. Sen's side. A fierce wind blew into the car, accompanied by the sound of waves crashing on the shore. Finally, she slid over to the driver's side but spent a long time adjusting Nasari and her sunglasses. Elliot turned and looked through the black window. The road was empty. Mrs. Sen turned on the radio, filling up the car with violin music. There's no need, Mr. Sen said, clicking it off. It helps me to concentrate, Mr. Sen said, and turned the radio on again. Put on your signal, Mr. Sen directed. I know what to do. For about a mile she was fine, though far slower than the other cars that passed her. But when the town approached, and traffic lights loomed on wires in the distance, she went even slower. Switch lanes, Mr. Sen said. You'll have to bear left at the rotary. Mrs. Sen did not. Switch lanes, I tell you! He shut off the radio. Are you listening to me? A car beeped its horn, then another. She beeped defiantly in response, stopped, then pulled without signaling to the side of the road. No more, she said, her forward resting against the top of the steering wheel. I hate it. I hate driving. I won't go on. She stopped driving after that. The next time the fish store called, she did not call Mr. Sen at his office. She had decided to try something new. There was a town bus that ran on an hourly schedule between the university and the seaside. After the university, it made two stops, first at a nursing home, then at a shopping plaza without a name, which consisted of a bookstore, a shoe store, a drug store, a pet store, and a record store. On benches under the portico, elderly women from the nursing home sat in pairs, in knee-length overcoats with oversized buttons, eating lozenges. Elliot! Mrs. Sen asked him while they were sitting on the bus. Will you put your mother in a nursing home when she is old? Maybe, he said. But I would visit every day. You say that now, but you will see. When you are a man, your life will be in places you cannot know now. She counted on her fingers. You will have a wife and children of your own, and they will want to be driven to different places at the same time. No matter how kind they are, one day they will complain about visiting your mother, and you will get tired of it too, Elliot. You will miss one day, and another, and then she will have to drag herself onto a bus just to get herself a bag of lozenges. At the fish shop, the ice beds were nearly empty, as were the lobster tanks, where rust-colored stains were visible through the water. A sign said the shop would be closing for winter at the end of the month. There was only one person working behind the counter, 
a young boy who did not recognize Mrs. Sen, as he handed her a bag reserved under her name. Has it been cleared and scaled? Mrs. Sen asked. The boy shrugged. My boss left early. He just said to give you this bag. In the parking lot, Mrs. Sen consulted the bus schedule. They would have to wait 45 minutes for the next one. And so they crossed the street and bought clam cakes at the takeout window they had been to before. There was no place to sit. The picnic tables were no longer in use. Their benches chained upside down on top of them. On the way home, an old woman on the bus kept watching them, her eyes shifting from Mrs. Sen to Elliot to the blood-lined bag between their feet. She wore a black overcoat, and in her lap she held, with gnarled, colorless hands, a crisp white bag from the drugstore. The only other passengers were two college students, boyfriend and girlfriend, wearing matching sweatshirts. Their fingers linked, slouched in the back seat. In silence, Elliot and Mrs. Sen ate the last few clam cakes in the bag. Mrs. Sen had forgotten napkins, and traces of fried batter dotted the corners of her mouth. When they reached the nursing home, the woman in the overcoat stood up, said something to the driver, then stepped off the bus. The driver turned his head and glanced back at Mrs. Sen. What's in the bag? Mrs. Sen looked up, startled. Speak English? The bus began to move again, causing the driver to look at Mrs. Sen and Elliot in his enormous rearview mirror. Yes, I can speak. Then, what's in the bag? A fish, Mrs. Sen replied. The smell seems to be bothering other passengers. Kid, maybe you should open a window or something. One afternoon, a few days later, the phone rang. Some very tasty halibut had arrived on the boats. Would Mrs. Sen like to pick one up? She called Mr. Sen, but he was not at his desk. A second time she tried calling, but then a third. Eventually she went to the kitchen and returned to the living room with the blade, an eggplant, and some newspapers. Without having to be told, Elliot took his place on the sofa and watched as she sliced the stems off the eggplant. She divided it into long, slender strips, then into smaller squares, smaller and smaller, as small as sugar cubes. I am going to put these in very tasty stew with fish and green bananas, she announced. Only I will have to do without the green bananas. Are we going to get the fish? We are going to get the fish. Is Mr. Sen going to take us? Put on your shoes. They left the apartment without cleaning up. Outside, it was so cold that Elliot could feel the chill on his teeth. They got in the car, and Miss Sen drove around the asphalt loop several times. Each time, she paused by the grove of pine trees to observe the traffic on the main road. Elliot thought she was just practicing while they waited for Mr. Sen. But then she gave a signal and turned. The accident occurred quickly. After about a mile, Mrs. Sen took a left before she should have, and though the oncoming car managed to swerve out of her way, she was so startled by the horn that she lost control of the wheel and hit a telephone pole on the opposite corner. A policeman arrived and asked to see her license, but she did not have one to show him. Mr. Sen teaches mathematics at the university, was all she said by way of explanation. The damage was slight. Mrs. Sen cut her lip, Elliot complained briefly of a pain in his ribs, and the car's fender would have to be straightened. The policeman thought Mrs. Sen had also cut her scalp, but it was only the vermilion. When Mr. Sen arrived, driven by one of his colleagues, he spoke at length with the policeman as he filled out some forms, but he said nothing to Mrs. Sen as he drove them back to the apartment. When they got out of the car, Mr. Sen patted Elliot's head. The policeman said you were lucky, very lucky to come out without a scratch. After taking off her slippers and putting them on the bookcase, Mrs. Sen put away the blade that was still on the living room floor and threw the eggplant pieces and the newspapers into the garbage pail. She prepared a plate of crackers with peanut butter, placed them on the coffee table, and turned on the television for Elliot's benefit. If he is still hungry, give him a popsicle from a box in the freezer, 
she said to Mr. Sin, who sat at the formica table sorting through the mail. Then she went into her bedroom and shut the door. When Elliot's mother arrived at a quarter to six, Mr. Sen told her the details of the accident and offered a check reimbursing November's payment. As he wrote out the check, he apologized on behalf of Mrs. Sen. He said she was resting, though when Elliot had gone to the bathroom, he'd heard her crying. His mother was satisfied with the arrangement, and in a sense, she confessed to Elliot as they drove home. She was relieved. It was the last afternoon Elliot spent with Mrs. Sen, or with any babysitter. From then on, his mother gave him a key, which he wore on a string around his neck. He was to call the neighbors in case of an emergency, and to let himself into the beach house after school. The first day, just as he was taking off his coat, the phone rang. It was his mother calling from her office. You're a big boy now, Elliot, she told him. You okay? Elliot looked out the kitchen window, at grey waves receding from the shore, and said that he was fine. End of Mrs. Sen's by Jumper Lahiri. This is an audio production read by me, Jordan Barclay, just doing this because I want to. If you enjoyed the production of this video, feel free to give it a like, I'd appreciate it. If you have any requests on what I should read next, comment below and I'll see if I can get to it as soon as possible. And if you want to be updated on these audio recordings, hit the subscribe button, it'd mean a lot to me. Alright guys, I'll see you with another story soon. Until then, I'm out. Peace.